Hello and welcome to the TaxCast from the Tax Justice Network. I'm Naomi Fowler. Coming up later... I looked at the Bank of England data and it was 3.5% of business lending went to manufacturing. A century or so ago, that number would have been more like 80%. And you can see that something's wrong. Finance has become kind of unmoored and disconnected from the real economy. Nick Shackson talks about his new book, The Finance Curse, How Global Finance is Making Us All Poorer with lots of implications for oversized finance sectors everywhere. No time for full headlines this month, but I do want to mention that Swiss whistleblower Rudolf Elmer has achieved a significant victory against Swiss banking secrecy laws and how far they can be applied in jurisdictions across the world. He worked, as you probably remember, for Swiss bank Julius Barr in the Cayman Islands when he leaked data on wrongdoing some years ago. Now, the Swiss Supreme Court has ruled that if employment contracts in locations outside Switzerland are local ones, Swiss banking secrecy doesn't apply and can no longer be used in those circumstances to impose jail terms on whistleblowers. To get this far, Rudolf Elmer has endured 48 prosecutorial interrogations, six months in solitary confinement and 70 court rulings. But he's been ordered to pay $325,000 towards court costs. It's not accurate, though, for the media to now be claiming that Swiss banking secrecy is over. It's dented, but it's far from over. It's still number one in the Tax Justice Network's Financial Secrecy Index. Let's see how it does in the next assessment. We're going to talk to John Christensen now from the Tax Justice Network for his take on this month. Okay, John, this month the world seems to have woken up to the brutality of the Saudis after um, it looks like a Saudi journalist critical of that regime was uh, brutally murdered in Turkey. Everybody seems to be trying to play down this murder, what looks like a murder. There's, you know, form left, right and centre on all this when you remember how Tony Blair shamelessly halted the serious fraud office investigation into the Saudi al Yaman bribes back in 2006. And, uh, you know, money talks, as we know. In Europe, we've seen murders of journalists who were working on corruption Nearly a year now since Daphne Caruana Galizia was killed in a car bomb in Malta. We've seen the murder of the Slovak journalist and uh, Bulgarian journalist whistleblowers too. So, uh, some dangerous times here. Turkey has imprisoned and tortured many journalists itself. The UK is 40th in the latest rankings for press freedom behind almost every other Western country. Well, if you look at governments across the world, it's true there are very few, if any, heroes. But I think the investigative journalists uh, come out at the very top of the list because it's been the investigative journalists who've been exposing all the corruption and the uh, violence uh, within these regimes. Uh, So the murders, the death threats, the accusations of false news, all of which are being targeted at journalists, I think reflect a shift in the way news is being provided. For years, in fact for decades, billionaire press barons have had really tight control over the media, particularly the printed media, but also television media. And as a result of that, key stories, really important stories, were simply treated as off-limits. They were never reported upon. In my opinion, that largely explains why tax havens have been ignored for close to half a century. And then you had Panama Papers and Paradise Papers. And if you think about both of those, they were unique collaborations between investigative journalists working across a very wide variety of media, exposing the corrupt activities of the global elites, including the media barons. And needless to say, once they were caught with their trousers down, the global elites were not going to take it very happily. But this is confirmed, I think, behind the mask of Western liberalism, There's been an astonishing hypocrisy in the UK, in the US and elsewhere in Europe. We've been doing business with some of the most monstrous regimes in the world, including Saudi Arabia, Saddam Hussein, the Assad family, kleptocrats across Africa. And that hypocrisy, I think, is now being exposed. It wasn't just the uh, corruption story about sales to Saudi Arabia that uh, were closed down upon decades of hypocrisy had been closed down and not reported on. 
I think Richard Nixon, the former president of the United States, spoke the truth when he talked about, you know, Western liberalism and the foreign policies these countries have adopted as being largely one of turning a blind eye to dictators on the grounds that they might be shits, but they're our shits. Uh, and that, I think, has largely shaped our foreign policy. So I think the killings reflect the degree to which powerful elites feel that they've lost control over the media, over the news agenda, because, you know, a lot of this reporting is happening through alternative media. The collaborations like Panama Papers and Paradise Papers confirm that. And the reaction, particularly amongst political elites, is not to take really strong anti-corruption measures. They're killing the messengers, literally killing the messengers in the case of Saudi Arabia. Yes, and uh, the tyranny of big money is not just a Saudi Thing. Um, all the focus in the UK and the United States has been on the, the threats from Russia. But apart from Russia, there's China, which is really important to understand the relationship, for example, with the British government, who basically gave the Chinese Communist Party all sorts of lucrative deals on nuclear power on British soil in exchange for allowing London to be the first jurisdiction outside China for the trading of the renminbi, which has expose the UK to all sorts of risks. Yes, um, the Chinese elites fall into a very different category. Uh, yes, they use offshore, famously they use British Virgin Islands and Macau and Singapore, but the threat they pose lies more with the very targeted way in which they are investing in strategically important industries, not just in Africa, but also in Europe and elsewhere, by which I mean things like the energy sectors, the transport infrastructure, and others. And this very strategic targeting, I think, exposes countries to risks which they haven't previously been exposed to. And I think that contrasts very strongly with r the Russian dark money flows. It seems to be far easier to take a defensive position against an oligarch with a large yacht moored in the Mediterranean than against a Chinese state-controlled energy company which just happens to operate a nuclear power station located in southwest Britain, which is the case. The risks are of a very different material type and order of magnitude. When we look at the Chinese investment flows, there are also very legitimate grounds for concern about national security when you have very prominent people former politicians like the uh, former Prime Minister David Cameron, uh, who, who's become involved with a private sector initiative known as the UK China Fund to funnel Chinese funding into major investments in Britain and elsewhere in Europe and indeed in China and in other countries. And the aim there is to invest in potentially very sensitive industries and infrastructure. Again, one has to raise questions about is former Prime Minister Cameron a serious investor, or is he using his former position as Prime Minister as a way of peddling political influence to open up the way for these kind of investments, which do pose security threats? And I think for that reason, we need to look very, very carefully at the way in which China operates using people like former Prime Minister Cameron to open the doors to their investment in strategic industries. Yes, indeed. And... Uh Probably the most neglected of all the big money interests and national security threats in terms of the corruption of democracy. You know, if you look at um, some of the big business interests that financed the Leave campaign for Brexit, and there were lots of concerns about Russian interference, and whatever your feelings about that referendum, lots of money came from the United States, and some of that was things like um, big agricultural interests who want access to the UK market, which they wouldn't be able to have under EU rules while the UK remains part of the EU because of restrictions on chemicals and treatment of meat products and things like that. What is really interesting is that uh, while everybody's been... Looking the other way, it seems, dark money forces have really been focusing on trying to actually change elements of the United States' famous constitution. Yes, and, and the writer, Nancy McLean, who's written what I think is a, an amazing and a really important book about the way in which dark money in the United States has been used to restrict the extent to which democracy at either state level or at federal level within the United States can be used to, to affect progressive change. And it, what's become clear is that this dark money has very severely constrained the opportunity for democratic change in the United States, but also elsewhere. Um, I think you're absolutely right to say that there's been a lot of US corporate interest in undermining the European Union, largely, I suspect, because the European Union has been 
progressive in areas like championing environmental protections, some social protections. I'm not going to present it as the world's nirvana, but the EU has been taking it further and faster than, than elsewhere. The, the US likes to kind of describe itself as the champion of the free world, but at the very least there needs to be some kind of deeper discussion about what freedoms are being championed by US dark money. I suspect, by and large, they're championing the freedom for monopoly capital to do whatever the hell it wants. Washington's somewhat in, uncritical championing of deeply repressive regimes, and Washington has been deeply invested in supporting regimes like Saudi Arabia for decades, not just Saudi Arabia, but Egypt and Israel. Now, to make matters worse, Washington's lack of commitment to tackling tax havens and offshore secrecy, they pushed back against international processes for information exchange, the common reporting standard, for example, which they haven't adopted. They've actively supported the growth of Tax Haven USA, by which I mean at the state level you've had the emergence of Delaware, Nevada, South Dakota, Wyoming and a whole host of other states which have emerged as, in combination, the world's leading tax havens. So that again, that poses a gigantic global security threat. And it's also not possible, I think, to talk about dark money from Russia, for example, and, and how that's harmed democracy without also raising concerns about how dark money from the US sources have been influencing politics in other countries. Britain, for example, we know that uh, US money uh, has been funding very prominent radical right think tanks and lobby groups in Britain. They are clearly interfering day in, day out with democracy in Britain. And they are also funding individual politicians in Britain the so-called Atlanticist group and other political influences are all funded by US dark money. And if the BBC rightly has concerns about Russian dark money engagement in politics in this country and elsewhere, they should equally be concerned about US dark money flowing into politics in Britain and elsewhere. Thanks, John. John Christensen of the Tax Justice Network. Now it's time for the TaxCast special feature. Everyone needs finance in their lives, but when finance becomes too big, it's bad for economies and bad for people. This month, the Sheffield Political Economy Research Institute released the first ever numerical estimate of the true costs of the City of London's oversized finance centre to the British economy. Two economists from the team that did this number crunching also calculated the costs of Wall Street finance to the US economy a few years ago using the same methodology. I'll give you those details at the end. And it turns out that the costs to the UK economy are even higher than in the United States. £4.5 trillion in lost economic output calculated over a 20-year period. That's equivalent to £67,500 for every person in the UK. That's not far off $90,000. This research has serious implications for oversized financial centres everywhere. Here on the TaxCast to talk about all this is Nick Shackson, whose new book, just out, is called The Finance Curse. How global finance is making us all poorer. Well, let's start with the, the City of London, which boasts 360,000 banking jobs, 31 billion in direct tax revenues last year. How can that not be good news, first of all? Well, this is the sort of facts that dazzles everybody. They look at all these, these banking jobs and tax revenues, but they are pulling a simple trick. Um, and the simple trick is to look at only one side of the balance sheet because a large financial center produces a number of benefits and it produces a number of costs as well. The benefits actually of a financial center do not come from so much jobs and tax revenues. They come from the services that they are supposed to provide from an economy. That is the function of a financial center. On the cost side, which they completely airbrush out of these things, you have enormous costs and a new research has just come out looking at the costs, the net costs, this is both sides of the balance sheet, of oversized finance to the UK economy. And they have calculated that because the City of London has been above its optimal size and not carrying out its its useful functions, this has cost the UK economy a cumulative four and a half trillion pounds between 1995 and 
2015. To put that in perspective, that's about £170,000 of lost output per British household. So this is an, a massive negative. I'm not saying for the City of London Financial Centre, I'm saying for an oversized City of London Financial Centre. In other words, if the city were back down to its optimal size, much smaller than it is today, and focused on what it should be doing, you know, channeling our savings into into genuine investment and good things like that, then our economy would have gained, according to these estimates, four and a half trillion over 20 years. Right. It seems that banking has gone further and further away from what we might call good investment into uh, some pretty poor investment decisions. And one seems to swallow up the other. If you look at the decline of UK manufacturing since the 1970s, it's been a lot faster compared to other industrial economies. And then at the same time, the financial sector assets have uh, grown so much larger a share of the economy than other nations uh, that you could compare it to. It's interesting that one seems to eclipse the other. Yes, very much so. I mean, the financial sector has basically crowded out other parts of the economy. It has damaged all sorts of other parts of the economy. It's rather like the resource curse that afflicts many mineral rich countries. Um, I used to live in Angola and reported for Reuters and the Financial Times there while it was in the middle of a brutal civil war. A, a, a very oil rich country, but its people seem to be not only not getting the benefit from that oil, it seems to be even worse than that. They seem to be even worse off than if they hadn't had those um, oil and diamond riches. And so the, so the resource curse is it's kind of a well-known, well-studied phenomenon uh, that afflicts many mineral rich economies. But the finance curse is very similar in many ways. For example, just to give you a few examples of the kind of mechanisms that are at play, the kind of ways that oversized finance damages your economy. Um, the most obvious one is probably the brain drain out of other sectors, out of government into finance, into much more highly paid finance. It's the same with an oil industry in Angola. It's sucking all the best people, best trained people, the, the talent out of industry, out of agriculture, out of government and um, taking them to this one dominant sector. It's the same with the City of London in the UK. You also get this thing called the Dutch disease, which uh, seems to have stricken Britain quite hard, where you have all these um, inflows of money coming into the country, raise what they call the real exchange rate or, or local price levels. And, and in this higher price environment, it, it's much harder for exporters to compete with imports. So um, you have manufacturing and other sectors Withering. It's another sort of hit alongside the brain drain that, that damages these sectors. You also get, you know, in the oil sector, you get huge boom and bust, which is incredibly destabilizing for economics and politics. But you get the same thing in the financial sector. The global financial crisis is the prime example of that. And you also get in a, with the case of the financial sector, you get a lot of what you might call dirty money, looted money, stolen money from particularly from poorer countries flooding in. And this kind of stuff brings it with a whole kind of payload of corruption and oligarchs coming in, you know, getting their hooks into your economy, into your politics that deliver all sorts of democratic, unmeasurable, invisible, but very, very real damage to your country and your your democracy and your political system. So these are just examples of the kinds of damage that you get on the other side of the balance sheet from the, you know, the jobs and tax revenues created that comes from having an oversized financial center that has turned away from its core functions and has become instead much more predatory. Right. And um, if you actually look at the amount of investment in the what we might call the productive economy versus this all this finance stuff where banks are doing all this kind of churning and making money out of money and speculation, uh, less than 4% of business lending actually went to manufacturing in the UK in 2017. And, uh, you know, non-financial investment in the UK is the lowest now of any G7 economy and uh, even the lowest in the whole of the OECD since 1997. I mean, that's no wonder the economy is stagnating. Yes, and... and I think a lot of British people don't really realise this. There's a lot of noise made about productivity, labour productivity, and Britain's productivity is something like 20 to 25 percent lower than that of other countries like France and Germany. And Britain really is, you know, this is the supposedly competitive, high finance, clever, whizzy hedge fund 
economy that is actually performing much worse and and you know poverty and inequality rates are much worse than um, than in most of Britain's peers uh, peer countries so yes exactly i mean you know i looked at the bank of england data and it was 3.5% of business lending went to manufacturing a century or so ago that number would have been more like 80% and uh, that's a trend that, that has been going on for a long time. And you compare this three and a half percent going to manufacturing with 75 percent going to either finance or real estate. And you can see that something's wrong. Finance has become kind of unmoored, um, disconnected from the real economy. And it has become much more predatory. And a, a lot of what it does. And here's another round of damage is this phenomenon called financialization, where real things going on in the real economy, you know, companies brewing beer or, or making, you know, staplers or whatever, they start to turn away from building kind of better and better value products as their managers start to focus increasingly on financial engineering to tease out more profit for the owners. And that financial engineering will very often include loading up these companies with more debt, running them more aggressively through tax havens. In, in other words, to try and sort of chisel more money out of the different stakeholders of the company on behalf of the owners. And so this is another round of damage to the productive economy. So you see huge profits being made in the city of London, but these are literally a counterpart. They are the flip side of damage being caused to other parts of the economy. So once again, you know, we see these profits, we see these jobs and these tax revenues, and we think these are a good thing, but they are a sign very much of, of economic sickness. I mean, I'm not saying that all of the value of the financial center has gone away. They're, you know, they are still providing useful functions. They are, you know, providing bank accounts and, and providing at least a little bit of in investment for the real economy. But most of what's going on has turned away from this and has turned to this more predatory stuff. OK, and um, obviously there are very powerful interests involved in uh, the finance sector. And uh, to a certain extent, what you tend to see as an element of the finance curse is this kind of capture of governments and the policy decisions that they make. Um, but another very strong reason why nothing is really done to tackle this problem of an oversized finance sector and what that's doing to an economy like the UK's economy is because of this story, this very powerful narrative about the competitiveness agenda, as you call it. Yes. So the competitiveness agenda is probably, in my view, the, the greatest lobbying tool on behalf of finance and also on behalf of big corporations wanting tax cuts and other handouts. They tell us that a country must be um, we must be competitive. There's this kind of global race going on and uh, there's a lot of anxiety about it. And we must constantly be keeping up with other countries that are racing ahead in this global race. And they put out these indices of, uh, you know, with in the financial sector, they put, you know, City of London at the top, but only just and it's about to lose its place to Wall Street. But it turns out that this idea of national competitiveness or having a competitive financial center or a competitive tax system are complete and utter nonsense. Most good economists know this already. Countries in economic terms really don't compete with each other in any way that resembles, you know, competition between companies. Just to get a first sense of this, ponder the difference between a failed company like Carillion or Enron and a failed state like Syria. They're completely and utterly different beasts. You can make all sorts of try and make all sorts of comparisons. But at the end of the day, countries do not compete in any way that resembles the competition between companies. And also, when they're talking about we must be competitive, what they are talking about is the pursuit of mobile money in a globalized world. We must always do things to attract this mobile money. They call it investment, but that's actually very misleading. What they're talking about really is hot money. And it's usually very sort of flighty stuff. And this stuff, this kind of mobile money that they're chasing, and we have to always, you know, cut taxes to attract more of it to our shores. We have to deregulate to get more bankers in and more, more financial activity these kinds of things. This is the competitiveness agenda. It always means giving subsidies of some kind, goodies, to large multinationals and big banks. And who is providing those subsidies? Well, they are extracted from other parts of the economy. So we as citizens have to hand over goodies to these large global multinationals and large financial institutions in order that they may compete better on the global stage. Well, that might be good for those 
for large financial institutions, but it isn't necessarily good for the country as a whole because you've got to extract the goodies from one side and give it to another side. What it does do, though, is it increases inequality very dramatically because the owners of these large multinationals are overwhelmingly the wealthiest sections of society. But it also increases when you do this, you attract more finance, you get more finance curse. All these other dimensions of damage that I've been talking about are magnified. So your country is going to suffer all sorts of harms like lower, slower economic growth, damaged democracy. Everything you can basically think of that you would want in a healthy economy is being damaged by this pursuit of this particular vision of competitiveness, what I call the competitiveness agenda. It is basically a recipe for deepening the finance curse. And it's absolutely unremittingly harmful. It is always harmful pursuing this kind of competitiveness as if countries competed like companies did. But it's something that people like hearing. They love the thrills of competition. And, you know, competition is great, right? And they don't think very hard beyond that very simple beguiling formula. Um, you know, competition is good. Therefore, competitive countries must be good. The only thing that these two things share really is a word in the English language competition. But they are completely different things. One is you know, in many cases, beneficial competition in markets is, you know, if the markets are not rigged, then, you know, a lot of good can come out of that. But supposed competition between countries or between cities or between states is always harmful. OK, and a very big turning point in all this was when certainly in the UK, Tony Blair said that we must accept the irrepressible forces of capitalism, you know, a bit like white water rafting. <laughs> you, you, there's nothing you can do about it. You just have to go along with it. And uh, if you look at the United States, there's very high awareness about the danger of monopolies and uh, how that has driven out genuine competition and accelerated this kind of state capture that we were talking about. Well, I think the United States has traditionally been the home of anti-monopoly of guarding against, you know, the Americans have been, you know, traditionally very wary of big government, but they've also been very wary of big, overwhelming power of business as well. And so there is this old anti-monopoly tradition in the United States. It was lost from about the 1970s onwards when people narrowed down the definition of monopolies um, down to the simple question of price, you know, is the price right? ignoring much bigger issues, the structure of markets and the issue of power, economic power and political power. But in the last couple of years in the United States alone, there has been some very significant resurgence of anti-monopoly tradition. There have been some groups and politicians, Elizabeth Warren, the Open Markets Institute, who have been fighting back against this. I think in Europe and in Britain, people are still to a fairly large degree still asleep on these issues. And I would argue that this is one of the great untold stories that needs to be opened up in particularly in Europe now. I think, you know, I see monopolies, you know, the, the anti-monopoly fight is at least as important as the fight against tax havens, I think. And they share many similarities as well. Both of these are issues that should worry people across the political spectrum. You know, on, on the traditional left, people worried about the power of large corporations on the right. People worried about the corruption of markets and these kinds of things. But this is another example the whole rise of monopoly power among large corporations in particular, financial institutions, too big to fail banks, big four accounting firms, traditional things that the Tax Justice Network and others have, have long been um, very interested in. This is probably the largest component of what people call financialization. This is the extraction of wealth from markets by large financial players and multinationals using what you might call financial engineering techniques. Often it involves cobbling together, you know, different companies into one framework so that there's no competition anymore. We're talking huge amounts of money now flowing away from workers, for example, towards the shareholders of corporations. Consumers are getting fleeced all over the place. Taxpayers are also getting fleeced as these corporations become more powerful. It becomes harder to tax them. So this is another big, important component of financialization and the finance curse. It seems that, you know, many people would, would see this as a separate subject from finance, but in fact, it's very, very intricately connected with the whole finance curse. OK, and uh, what I thought was really interesting in your book is saying how, certainly for the UK, you're saying that we can step out of the finance curse unilaterally. 
Um, you know, because there's so much talk about how international agreements must be struck and, you know, countries have to cooperate on these matters. Um, so I thought it was really interesting, some of the proposals that you were making about how a country might actually do those things. Can you um, explain a bit about that? Well, I think there is this kind of widespread misconception that there is some sort of trade off between, you know, regulating and policing the financial sector properly and your own prosperity as a country. I think people think, well, you know, we, we don't really like the city, all this kind of foreign money laundering that it's involved in and all this kind of dodgy stuff. But, you know, if we crack down too hard, then we're going to lose all these jobs in the city. So they're kind of, you know, a lot of British people are ambivalent about about this thing. The finance curse cracks this wide open because it says there is no trade off at all. If you properly crack down and regulate and police this stuff properly, you will not only achieve fantastic democratic ends, you will also increase your prosperity. You will have you will reduce the finance curse. You will have higher economic growth. You will have lower inequality. It's basically win, win, win all the way. So, you know, there has been this kind of this worry about there being a trade off has been a huge blockage to to reform. And people haven't really understood that actually the way is clear. I think once people understand this and sort of dethrone the competitiveness agenda and take on the idea of the finance curse, then all that's left between us and proper reform is power, which is, of course, not a small obstacle. But um, at least the ideological obstacle is gone. And once you've got that out of the way, then all sorts of new possibilities open up. Right. And you talk about uh, the ability that each country should take on, which is to control toxic money flows into and out of economies. How, how would that work? Well, w what I describe in the conclusion of the book, it's just a sort of sketch of an idea. It's what I call smart capital controls. And I don't mean here controlling flows at the border. What I mean is trying to keep the harmful inflows out of the country to try and stop some of this damaging stuff from coming in in the first place, bringing with it this whole payload of the finance curse, you know, the brain drain, the inequality, the instability and all that. And the way to do that is simply to tax and regulate your economy as you really should. You make your land registry a 100 times more transparent to discourage, you know, the wrong kind of money coming in. You increase tax rates. You could introduce a land value tax that would affect, you know, anybody coming in and buying a property in the UK would have to pay this tax. All these kinds of measures, which people have been scared of putting in place because they're worried it'll, it'll frighten the money away. A financial transaction tax is another good example. People say, yes, but you'll, you'll lose all this financial activity. But the finance curse show that this is a good thing. This is exactly what you want. You want to chase this stuff away and leave the good stuff behind because the good stuff is stuff that is embedded in your economy. It's proper investment with local supply chains and managers sending their kids to local schools and, you know, good corporate citizens. If it's well embedded, then a little bit more tax or a little bit more regulation isn't going to scare it away. If it's the sort of flighty stuff flitting around the world looking for the best kind of loophole, then these measures might well chase that stuff away. But that's what you want, because this is the stuff that doesn't bring the kind of gold and benefits. It brings the finance curse. So, you know, the smart capital controls is another way of saying, you know, tax, regulate, police your financial sector and your economy as you should. And not only don't be afraid of scaring the hot money away, actively try to keep it out because it is dangerous stuff. Nick Shapson's book, The Finance Curse, How Global Finance is Making Us All Poorer, is published by Bodley Head of Penguin Books. He's currently writing the US version of the book, which will be out in 2019. You can read more about The Finance Curse and the number crunching on the costs of the City of London from the Sheffield Political Economy Research Institute at www.taxjustice.net forward slash finance curse. And if you want to read up on the costs of too much finance on the US economy, that report's called Overcharged, the High Cost of High Finance, published by the Roosevelt Institute. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next month.